would turn in your Bible to the book of Acts, <clears throat> chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. While you're turning, let me just to begin with my introduction. My, my sermon title is called The Spread of the Gospel, Acts chapter 8, The Spread of the Gospel. I love the book of Acts. I don't know if you do, but, but I love that book. And the last time I preached from the book of Acts, it's, it was about two and a half years ago. I preached on Acts chapter 9. I preached on the conversion of Saul or Paul, Acts 9, God conquers an enemy. And there we saw the dramatic change in Paul's life from persecutor to preacher, from one uh, no longer marked by arrest warrants, but by apostolic authority. And tonight what I want to do is take a short step backwards to Acts chapter 8, where we get a snapshot of the early church immediately prior to Jesus' confrontation of Saul or, or Paul. And we could break this chapter up into three or four parts and then preach an individual sermon on each one. And um, I'm not going to do that tonight, obviously. What I want to do is take an aerial view of Acts chapter 8 and press home some big picture themes that we find here in this chapter, as well as their connections to the, the, within the chapter, uh, within the book of Acts, uh, the New Testament, and, and even the Old Testament. Surprise, surprise. So let me set some context for Acts chapter 8 first. Uh, Jesus has been crucified. He's been raised from the dead. He's appeared to his disciples over a period of some 40 days, and he makes this significant promise before his ascension to the right hand of the Father. Acts 1.8 says, But you, speaking to the disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And Peter, with boldness, stands, and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, stands as the representative of the whole of the disciples, and with authority and with boldness, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches in such a way that 3,000 respond to the message with faith and are baptized. And so we see the first half of that Acts 1-8 promise has, has come to fruition. The Holy Spirit has come upon them, and they are given boldness to be his witnesses at this point. But what is it that will propel the church outward from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth, as Acts 1-8 promises? How does the church grow into these ever-expanding concentric circles of, of, of expansion and influence outside of Jerusalem? That it is what Acts 8 begins to address. Now, Acts 6 through 8 really should be read together, but don't worry, I won't read all three chapters tonight. But, but in these chapters, we meet and follow two significant characters in the early church, Stephen and Philip. Stephen takes center stage midway through Acts chapter 6 and through the end of 7. His story is the biblical record of the first martyrdom, the first murder of a Christian since Jesus had been crucified. Stephen had been characterized as, quote, a man full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, full of faith and power. Acts 6, 3 and 8, he's killed while preaching Christ, having been stoned outside of the city of Jerusalem, dying as he prays for the forgiveness of those who have stoned him. Philip takes center stage in Acts 8. Who is Philip? He is one of the servants who was chosen along with Stephen and five others to administer the daily distribution of food to the widows in Jerusalem. The characteristics of the men chosen for this task were as follows. Acts says, uh, this is the instruction from the apostles, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Acts 6.3. So, so this is not, strictly speaking, the office of deacon here, but what happened at this point may have formed the foundation of that office. But following their installment to care for the widows, these two men then eventually go on to do great things for God. They were servants with preaching gifts and endowed by the Holy Spirit to perform signs and wonders. Now, with that context in place, let's read our text for tonight, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 40. Look there with me. And Saul approved of his execution. 
This is obviously Stephen's. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who, <clears throat> who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise, and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Then he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Well, tonight, I want to point out uh, about three things. There are many, many, many things that we could point out from this passage, but uh, I would be run out of town if I uh, preached on them all. We're going to pick about three of them. What's the first thing that we learn from this passage? Now, first of all, persecution was the instrument God used to spread the gospel beyond Jerusalem. We see that in verses 1 through 8. Persecution was the instrument God used to bring the gospel beyond 
Jerusalem. The, the enemies of the church here appear to have gained the upper hand. If you look at verses 1 through 3 again, Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church, church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. The language here leaves nothing positive to the imagination, does it? Great persecution, great lamentation, ravaging, prison, scattered throughout the regions. Christ's enemies thought that this great persecution would contain this preaching of what Acts calls the way, the Christian way. They sought to confine and stamp out the preaching of Christ, and it looked like it was going to have that result. However, as we've learned so many times in Scripture, as it says at the end of Genesis, what God and, or what people meant for evil, God often means for good. And instead of stamping out the word, this persecution becomes the efficient cause of the sowing of the word everywhere. Look at how verse 4 reads. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Interesting. By the end of it, uh, in, in verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. What city? In Samaria, which is this major, huge step in the progress uh, of the gospel. Uh, this picture of the scattering of Christians in uh, Acts 8, 1 and 4, notice that that word is used in both places. In, in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, uh, they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Uh, this picture of Christians being scattered is, is actually a nice ironic metaphor. For here the text that's rendered scattered is the same Greek word that is used for scattering or sowing seed. Jesus uses this word, for example, in his parable about, about the, the seeds falling on soil. And those represent what? The word being broadcast everywhere, right? Right? And so here, the scattering of the witnesses all throughout the regions ensures the scattering of the word throughout those very same reasons, uh, regions. Now, sometimes in our own experience, we do one thing, anticipating an outcome, but it turns out that the exact opposite is produced. When I worked at Starbucks, uh, yes, I was once a barista. I once had a former life as a manager with Starbucks. Uh, we were taught that when you mixed up your hot mocha syrup to get it ready so you could, you know, pump it out for your, 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 your yummy mochas, um, you were putting boiling water in with the mix to, to mix it up. But you had to let it cool first before you put it in the refrigerator because if you put it in there hot, it would create this protective layer where the outside might cool, but the inside would stay hot, and then it would become a breeding ground for all kinds of bacteria that were harmful. So what, what, what should have been something healthy, right? Mochas are healthy for you, uh, ends up producing uh, disaster and, and, and ill health or death. Uh, so so our, our first point here tonight is that persecution, unbeknownst to the persecutors, becomes the instrument that God uses to spread the gospel beyond Jerusalem. Now, what, what should we at Founders uh, learn from this? Well, number one, Adverse circumstances are not limitations on God's ability to act. We often think that that's true, or at least we live like it's true, right? If I meet with adverse circumstances, then that's sort of the end of what I'm able to do. Paul didn't think that. In 2 Timothy 2, 8 and 9, Paul says this, writing from a Roman prison, knowing that his death is impending. This is his final Roman imprisonment. He says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached by my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And so Paul would say, if you're meeting with adversity, don't mope. <laughs> don't give up. Consider Paul's attitude in Philippians, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. He writes this from a prison as well during his first Roman imprisonment. 
where he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul's enemies had hoped to silence the gospel, and yet the exact opposite was being achieved, and not just in Jerusalem where he was arrested, but now throughout the Roman world. It's amazing. And so we should have some proper perspective here, shouldn't we? When things grow hard for you as a Christian or for the church, we need to ask not why, but who? We need to ask not why has this happened, but rather whom does the Lord want me to reach because of this state of affairs? You have a choice when adversity or obstacles come up. You can either sit and give up, or you can go around that wall. Satan would want for us to quit. Satan would want for us to give up, as would our enemies. But the church should be sort of like a half-filled balloon, right? When you squeeze it, it doesn't pop. Just a strange shape pops out of your, your hand somewhere, right? Um, or, or, or maybe think about how uh, an ant line, if you were to put an obstacle in front of a, of a, of a series of ants walking along uh, the sidewalk, well, what do the ants do when that obstacle is placed in front of them? Do they just stop and do nothing? Absolutely not. They, they go around it or, or they, they, they go over it because ants were designed to keep moving toward their goal. And so the church is as well. It's designed to proclaim the word of God, the excellencies of Christ. And when you're providentially hindered from proclaiming the word in one way, then God wants you to fulfill your God-given design in another way. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? What's our purpose for being all these things? Peter says, That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you know what? You can do that in any circumstance, no matter what. A recent example of this uh, mindset uh, came out the other day as I was watching Fox, uh, of all places. uh, And um, whether you agree with MacArthur's stand on holding church services or not in California in violation of the governor's uh, edicts and and, and the health codes of of L.A. County, um, I don't want to debate the merits or demerits of that, but I think his attitude is right when he uh, he said this. Uh, he mentioned that if the authorities put him in jail for flouting the COVID rules, he'd start a prison ministry. And here's what he said. If they want to tuck me into jail, I'm open for a jail ministry. I've done a lot of other ministries and haven't had the opportunity to do, to do that one, so bring it on, unquote. So, so I, I, this is the right mindset. I will preach the gospel from my pulpit, and if they stick me somewhere else, then I'm going to preach the gospel from there. Adversity makes not one difference as to whether I fulfill my calling or commission. Now, somebody may ask, uh, are you saying, Philip, that, uh, that, that whenever adversity and persecution breaks out, I just need to run headlong into it and, and embrace it? And I would say, well, no, not exactly. Uh, in times of distress, it may be okay to seek alleviation of the circumstances as long as you don't neglect the essential calling and task that you have by God, which is to bear the name of Jesus at all times. Notice, for example, in our text, go back to Acts chapter 8. Notice how the disciples handled the outbreak of persecution in Jerusalem. In verse 1, it says they scattered. In verse 4, it says those who were scattered. So they, they scattered. <laughs> they, they ran off in different directions. They didn't line up in the streets of Jerusalem with crosses on their backs saying, yo, here's a cross if you want to hang me on it. They didn't, um, you know, pile up stones and say, here, grab one. Um, They they didn't volunteer for a martyr's death. They actually left the places where the persecution was the fiercest and the heaviest. And so it's, it's not a problem to do that. I think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 20 and 21. Different context, but but a similar principle. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? 
Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. And I think Paul would say, if, if you're feeling the heat of persecution and you can get away from it, do that, right? If God in his providence gives you the, the ability to do it. But, uh, but he is not calling us to go and seek a martyr's death. What did these believers do? Did they neglect their duty while they scattered? Verse 4 says, those who were scattered went about preaching the word, preaching the word. So that's, that's the first thing. Persecution is the means by which God causes the gospel to spread beyond Jerusalem. Second, the church expands through preaching Christ. Do you believe that, church? The church expands through preaching Christ. The church is committed to a message. That is fundamentally what we do. If you survey our passage, you'll notice that the things that the disciples do are focused around one all-important thing, and that is preaching. Let's look at a, a handful of the verses in chapter 8. This is a people with a message which will not be silenced. And I want you to think about how this message is descri described in each of these, these places. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 35, excuse me, verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. That's a bonus verse. There's three different ways preaching is, is talked about there. And then uh, verse 35 then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And verse 40, but Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is a church with a message. Why would the, 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 why would the church be so committed to proclaiming this message? Why should this be so? The answer is that in the New Testament, preaching is the primary means that God uses to build up his church and to convert lost sinners. Everything else is secondary as we consider ways of reaching out to our community. Now, there are many Christians who view a lot of other things as primary or central to the church besides the giving of the message of Christ. And when I say the message of Christ, I don't just mean new evangelism where you're only gaining converts. I mean preaching to, to those who, who need to be converted, but then also preaching to those who need to be brought up and nurtured in the faith. Uh, both of these are things that God has called us to do. We build up the church and we convert lost sinners through preaching that is primary. For some people, though, other things have gotten primary. Today, it seems like a commitment to social justice or racial justice is the primary thing that the church is called to do if you listen to what people are saying. Um, I, I'm sorry to say this, but one of my former students I read uh, tweeted something uh, to this effect. This was back uh, during the, uh, when the George Floyd um, thing happened. Uh, she, she said this, if you are a pastor or church leader, I, I'm summarizing, I can't remember exactly how she put it, but something like this. If you are a pastor or ch church leader, but have not addressed matters of uh, racial justice, you have no credibility with me, and you don't really have anything to say that I want to hear from you. Now, I, I was astounded by that. Thinking about that, there are faithful gospel preachers out there who've maybe in the last month have not tweeted anything about social justice and racial relationships? Are you really telling me that their gospel tweets have no bearing with you? But other things have become central for other people. For some, lifestyle and moral living are viewed as primary. Now, I'm not saying that it's unimportant how you live, but how you live is not sufficient or even the most important thing. Uh, when our son, John Philip, He's now 21. It's hard to imagine that he's grown up so quickly. But when he was a child, he used to give himself to grunting. He wanted something, 
Uh. And we had to teach him this little expression. Maybe some of you have taught it to your kids. John Philip, use your words. Use your word. Don't grunt at daddy. <laughs> no. Use your words. God gave you words. Use them. Mommy and daddy have taught you words. Use your words. And Christians need to be told that too. Use your words. Don't think that merely a lifestyle is enough to bring people to the point of conversion. We act like spiritually immature children when we lean upon communication that refuses to use the words of gospel proclamation. Listen to 1 Timothy 6.1. This is what Paul says. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that, here's why, the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. That's an interesting statement to me for, for this reason. If a servant is living in such a way that is dishonorable, Paul says that the name of God and the teaching, meaning Christian doctrine, is going to be reviled. And that only makes sense if what's happening, if those servants are opening their mouths and making known that they belong to Jesus and that there is some content of teaching to which they are to be living up to. If you stand for nothing in your speech, then your lifestyle can't undo anything. Philippians 2, 14 through 16, Paul says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to what? The word of life. He addresses behavior here in Philippians, but you engage in that right behavior, holding the word of life along with it. For some people, miracles are the thing. That was a Texas way to say thing, the thing. But even in the, the book of Acts, miracles are subservient to the proclamation of the word. They attest to the preaching. They are there not as ends in themselves, but as occasional and very occasional attestations to the divine source of their message. We do not find apostles always performing miraculous signs and wonders, but we do find them always preaching the word. Or to put it another way, signs are always accompanied by preaching, but preaching is not always accompanied by signs and wonders. Let's just do a real, just a really quick blitz through some of this. Uh, Acts chapter 4. Oh, I have an hour left. Awesome. Okay, um, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Look there, Acts 4, 29. Here's what the church prays, and here's what happens after they had experienced some persecution being locked up. Um, verse 29, and now, O Lord, they pray, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Okay, great. We got the preaching. Verse 30, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Uh-oh. Signs and wonders? I thought you said that wasn't that important. Let's keep reading. Verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what was the effect of the filling of the Holy Spirit here? And they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't also occasionally engage in signs and wonders. But the filling of the Spirit's primary role and purpose here is what? It's to equip believers to preach the word. Acts chapter 5, look there, verses 20 and 25. The Lord opens the, the prison doors here and, and, and says to them, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Verse 25. And someone came to the Jewish leaders and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So, so here, this is right after a record of some tremendous healing activity. Uh, Peter's shadow 
even heal somebody here. And we find that when the apostles are freed from prison, they are commanded by the angel of the Lord not to go and heal and get more people marveling, but rather to go and to preach at the temple. And that's exactly what their energy was devoted to. For they uh, were said to be standing in the temple and teaching the people. And in chapter 5, verse 42, near the end of this entire incident, look at what it says. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease what? Teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Acts chapter 6, verse 4, the apostles say this as they contemplate the the matter of of, of appointing men to, to help with the widows. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It's interesting that they don't put a signs and wonders uh, healing ministry there. That's what a lot of churches do, isn't it? That's not what the apostles did. Acts 19, 11 through 12 and 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Woohoo! Pentecostals dream, right? Look at this. Prayer handkerchiefs. Paul was on to something. Amazing. And then we read about the seven sons of Sceva in that city who tried to perform exorcisms in Jesus' name, but they could not because they didn't know the Lord Jesus. And so the demon-possessed man beats the tar out of them. And when it became known among the Greeks and Jews, there was fear and a great number of conversions. But, but, but key to all of this is how Luke describes the victory in Acts 19.20. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Hmm, where's the attention to all the special signs and wonders? That that wasn't that wasn't Luke's um, that wasn't Luke's uh, primary uh, purpose, was it? So as Founders Baptists, we must be committed primarily to the message of the cross, to the preaching of Christ, of His uh, all-sufficient life and death and resurrection for us needy. Sinners, And if we're to be the kind of church that God wants us to be, we must be characterized by a commitment to a message. And what will the effect of a commitment to that message be for the church? That when the church grows, it's going to grow because the word grows. The church grows when the word grows. Throughout the book of Acts, there are these really interesting, uh, if we can put it this way, progress reports. Where, where, where Luke, the writer, punctuates different uh, parts of, 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 of his book uh, with these statements of how the church's victory is, is, is being carried forward at these different scenes, right? In Jerusalem, and then in, in Judea and Samaria, and eventually getting out to the, to the ends of the earth. For example, just listen to these and It's so interesting. Listen to how Luke describes the progress of the church. He describes it in in, in, in terms of the word. 6-7, X 6-7, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests became obedient to the faith. The word increases, the disciples multiply. Chapter 12, verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. There it doesn't even mention the size of the church. The church is growing because the word increased and multiplied. Isn't that interesting? Chapter 13, verses 48 and 49. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. The word of the Lord was spreading. 1920, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. It's almost like the word is this organism, moving, growing, expanding. And we know that the Bible's not growing, right? So how does the word increase? Because it's passed on by the church, by mouth. And so, brothers and sisters, we must be confident in the power of the word to change hearts and lives. We are a church with a message Look at the effect of the preaching of Philip in Samaria. Look, look back at Acts chapter 8 or forward to chapter... I forget where I was the last time I turned, but here, here we are. Acts chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Look at the wording here. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip, 
And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, when they heard him and saw the signs that he did for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. They, they hear, they, they heed the message, they see the miracles, and the text says there was great joy in the city. And not only that, but we see them doing something really amazing. They exchange their affections for Simon the sorcerer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've been following along in our study in in the, uh, in the book of Genesis uh, for our, our adult Bible fellowships, uh, you'll know that a lot of the questions I ask have to do with focusing on, on specific words and words that are repeated. And, and, and it's interesting here how Luke uh, characterizes uh, Simon and his ministry uh, compared to Philip and, and his preaching ministry. For example, if you look at verse 10, uh, look, look there. It says that they all, and it depends on which translation you got, they all heard or they all gave heed to Simon. But now in verse 6, as Philip comes, it says that they all heard or, or gave heed to him. We learn in verses 9 and 11 that Simon used to astonish all the people of Samaria. In verse 9, it says, or, or, or here the ESV says, amazed, that, that this guy named Simon amazed the people of Samaria. Verse 11, they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But what do we see is their response to Philip's ministry in verse 13. After being baptized, Simon believed. He continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was Amazed. Isn't that interesting? The one who amazed everybody else was now amazed by what God was doing through the preaching and ministry of Philip. Simon also had been thought to be the great power of God in verse 10. And the word great is used here, the word power and the word of God. But now Philip demonstrates that he is preaching the kingdom of the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of verse 13, it, 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 it reads literally, Simon was seeing the signs and the great powers. Great and powers is the same Greek word that's used to describe Simon. But now Simon sees that these great powers are being performed by Philip. And so Philip turns the town upside down. He who had once captivated the people with his magic arts now becomes captive to the preacher of Christ. And this is a great victory for the ministry of the word. And so be confident in the power of the word to have its intended effect because God is sovereign over the effect of the word. Our use of the word is not magic, as some like to think. It's not manipulative. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not our ability. It's not our incantations. The word is a tool in the hand of God. It is his powerful Word And our proclamation of the word doesn't guarantee the results that we seek. How do we know that's true? Go back a chapter. Stephen was mighty in the word. Stephen proclaimed a powerful message. And what happened at the end of that? Nobody seemed to be converted by it. He was killed. And then when Philip proclaims a powerful word, many people rejoice and they are saved. And, and I think Luke deliberately characterizes the Samaritan's response to Philip uh, really as, as, as a contrastive echo to the response of Stephen's murderers. Go, go back to Acts 7 just, just real quickly. And, and, and notice this. In Acts 7, 57 and 58, it says, they cried out with a loud voice. These are the, the, the Jewish synagogue folk that, that he was debating with, Stephen. They cried out with a loud, loud voice and stopped their ears. Okay, so, so they, they put their fingers on their ears and rushed together. If you have the New American Standard with one accord at him, then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Acts 8, 6 through 8, similar words here. And the crowds with one accord, we saw that in Stephen's listeners as well, they did something with one accord, but not this. <laughs> it 
In Acts 8, with one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs. Verse 8, and so there was much joy in that city. Did you notice that the word city was used with Stephen as well? There wasn't a whole lot of joy there. He was cast out of the city and stoned, but here Philip is welcomed in the city, and there is much joy there. In the one case, they unite to destroy God's messenger, and in the other, they unite to hear and rejoice. As one of my friends uh, used to say, you know the Lord is at work in the preacher when you look out and some are weeping and others are sleeping. God's sovereign over his word and it can powerfully save some and it can harden others. God is responsible for the effect of his word. So, you know, we, we, we often ask, what determines the response? That, that really isn't the right question, is it? It's who determines the response. Acts 16, 14 tells us that the Lord opened Lydia's heart so that she attended to the things Paul spoke. And Acts 13, 48 says that it was those ordained to eternal life who believed in the gospel. And, and therefore, we must pray and earnestly beseech God that by the Holy Spirit, he may use the the word preached and that he may make it powerful and effective to accomplish his will. And the word is powerful when God chooses to bless it. I think I've read this quote before in another context, but when Luther was asked how he was able to accomplish so much in the Reformation, he, he said this, I simply taught, preached, wrote God's word, otherwise I did nothing, And when, while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip in my Amsdorf, by the way, he clearly wasn't a Baptist there, right? There's a Lutheran talking. Um, But while I slept or drank, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor inflicted such damage upon it. The word did it all. And I say, amen. Do you confidently rest on the power of the word? James 121 says, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. All right, last thing I want to say is that we have a gospel for all people everywhere. We have a gospel for all people everywhere. Uh, there is a major theological contextual point that Acts chapter 8 is um, trying to get across. Acts 8 is all about the first entry of the gospel into Samaria. The geographical expansion that we see happening there is a movement from Jerusalem through Judea and out to Samaria, but there's another important dimension to this expansion. This geographical expansion is also a movement away from the temple. It's a movement away from the temple. Now note, Acts 8 follows... Acts 7. And in Acts 7, we have Stephen preaching. And so in Stephen's preaching, there is an accusation against Stephen who was said by those who accused him to be speaking against the temple and the Torah. That was their accusation. That was their trumped up charge. He was speaking against the temple and the Torah. And Stephen's answer is that ultimately God does not need a temple made with human hands in order to be present with his people. Much of Stephen's sermon, and it's a long one, focuses on this fact. God doesn't need a temple made with human hands to be present with his people. In the climax of the historical section of Stephen's message, he says this in Acts 7, 47 through 50. If you're in chapter 8, I think you can probably catch it here by not even turning your page. But it was Solomon who built a house for him, for God. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? And so Stephen paints a picture throughout his sermon of God's activity with his people, and almost all of it, refers to a time prior to the building of the temple. Yet God was present with his people. And so two major events in Acts chapter 8 are focused on the movement away from the temple. 
First, in the Samaritan's reception of the gospel, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. And secondly, in the eunuch's reception of the gospel and baptism. So note, first of all, the Samaritans. The Samaritans, if you know the his, a little bit of the history of them, uh, they, they were this mixed breed group that had separated themselves from the Israelites in the south during the time of exile. And they had developed a temple up in the north uh, at a place called Gerizim, Mount Gerizim. And, um, and so that was where they worshiped. And if you remember the, the story of John, uh, or in John's gospel of Jesus meeting with the Samaritan woman, she has a very pertinent question, right? Where's the, where, where, where's the place that, that we worship? Do we worship at, at this temple over here? Or do we worship at the one uh, in Jerusalem? And, and, and what does God tell, uh, Jesus tell this woman? He tells her that there, there's coming a day when that's not going to matter, right? God is seeking worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. And I think one of the things that that means is that you don't go to a place to worship. You go to a person to worship. But as these Samaritans now receive the word, they, remember they had parted company over the, the matter of the temple, uh, they received the word from Philip as he preaches. And now the Samaritans have access to God without having to go where? They don't have to go to Jerusalem. They don't have to go to the temple. In fact, what happens here? The apostles go from Jerusalem up to Samaria or down to Samaria, depending on whether you're speaking topographically or, or, or map-wise. But they, they go and they, they lay hands on them and they receive the Spirit. The temple's purpose historically throughout the Old Testament, was to, to be the place where you, you met with the presence of God. But now the presence of God is on the move. And you don't go to Jerusalem to find the presence of God anymore. The presence of God is going out to where God is bringing the gospel. And the Samaritans received the presence of God through the laying on of hands and the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And the Ethiopian eunuch marks a step in the progress of the gospel away from dependence on the temple. Because he was physically maimed, that's what a eunuch is, right? He was cut off from the temple. And so when he asks Philip, what hinders me from being baptized? What hinders me from becoming connected to Jesus, to this one that Isaiah was talking about? The answer in previous times would have been, well, I hate to tell you, buddy, but your physical condition hinders you from access to God's presence. Deuteronomy 23.1 uh, puts it more delicately than the ESV, so I'll read that. No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. So at one time in history, the eunuch could not gain access to the temple and to the presence of God. But now in Christ, Nothing hinders you because the Holy Spirit has come to all who are in Christ. The eunuch is not hindered from receiving the gospel, from receiving baptism, and from receiving the Holy Spirit and becoming in himself a little temple for God to dwell in. It's an amazing point. If we had time to develop this from Isaiah 56, we would, but we don't have time. And so the major point here is that God no longer requires people to come to a central location like Jerusalem in order to gain access to him by the temple, God is now going out to the ends of the earth. He is going to the heathen. And the implication for us is that we must be a going church. You must be a going people. We have to go to where people are. We who bear the gospel bring the presence of God to the people throughout the ends of the earth. Now, who does the going in Acts chapter 8? Who does the going there? Look at verse 4. You, you might answer, Philip did, right? But, and you would be right. Philip does go in Acts chapter 8. Uh, not the apostles, not the top dogs. Where they, they, he goes in, or somebody goes in and brings them brings the apostles up. Uh, but, but here is a servant. Here is a table server. 
And so you can't excuse yourself by saying, well, you know, the Acts 1-8 passage was given to the apostles and the commission to be Jesus' witnesses from, you know, J Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth is for the apostles. No, it wasn't the apostles who first took the gospel the next step. It was Philip, a servant of tables, a servant in the church, someone very much like you and I. But some may say, well, but, but Philip, Philip, he was, he was full of the Holy Spirit and, and, and full of, of wisdom, and, and that's, that's, that's not, not me. That's not me. He performed miraculous signs and wonders. He was a gifted preacher, but not so fast. Look at chapter 8, verse 4 again. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip is just one example pulled out of the many who went preaching the word after being scattered. Philip chronicled, is chronicled here because of the significance for Acts 1.8, but there were many who went out who were not chronicled except for this little verse here. And brothers and sisters, that's where we find ourselves today. That, that, that's you and me. We're, 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 we're those people. We're those normal people who wherever we are, wherever we go, we preach the word, we bring the word. So you don't need to be a pastor, an elder, a missionary to be going to the nations. You, you just have to be a Christian who understands his or her calling in Christ. Bear the word wherever you go. So, so where are you going? Where are you going? I know what happens in this church today. There's a woman in this church, where does she go? She sits right across the nail table in the nail shop and speaks the message of Christ to those who use her services. There's a man in this church who goes and meets with a coworker regularly, helping him to understand the meaning and message of Scripture. But where I ask, can more of us be going to bring the message? Where can you go? Where can I go? Founders needs you to do your part, one person at a time not to convert a whole city or state, but to use your words with your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, one life at a time. Spurgeon tells an interesting story. I'll finish with this. He says, I once heard a story of a foolish man who declared he could fight the whole British army. When he was asked how he could draw so long a bow as that, he said, this is what I would do. I know I'm the best swordsman in the world, so I would go and challenge one British soldier and kill him, then take another and kill him. And this way, I only want, this is an old English way of saying lack, I only lack time enough, and I would kill the whole British army. It was a ridiculous boast, but there was something in it that I could not bring out so well in any other way. If you want to conquer the world for the Lord Jesus Christ, rest assured we must do it in this foolish man's fashion. We must take people one by one, and these must be brought to Christ. Otherwise, the great mass will remain untouched. Do not imagine for a moment that you are going to convert a nation at once. You are to convert the people of that nation one by one through the power of God's Holy Spirit. It is not for you to suit your machinery and arrange your plans for the moving of a mass as such, you must look to the salvation of the units. End of quote. And to that I say amen, and the church says amen. amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this time to look at your word and to think about what it has to say about us and our calling. Lord, my concern and fear, I was talking with a brother about this, uh, we, we often have thought that, that maybe in our children's or our grandchildren's time, the American church might begin to experience persecution. But, but I am growing day by day more convinced that it might happen in my lifetime. And so, Lord, these things that we think about and, and, and have talked about tonight, preached about, uh, they, are, they are intensely relevant. And, Lord, we pray that you would use this to um, to, 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 to steal our nerves and to strengthen our resolve and our backbone, to be the church that you have called us to be and to live for the pleasure of our Savior Jesus. We thank you that you, through his atoning death, 
his life, death, burial, and resurrection, you spared no expense for us. Lord, may we spare no expense for you and for your purposes in this world. Lord, extend your kingdom through us. Use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand together.